everyone to the um, fifth annual Oxford Business Law Blog Conference uh, held uh, by the cooperation of Oxford University, the National University of Singapore, uh, the University of Hamburg, and the University of Berlin. So um, you might, I might take the opportunity to tell you a few things about the um, Oxford Business Law Blog, the OBLB. It's a big success story uh, in the law faculty. It started publication in March 2016, and big thanks are due to our benefactors, Travis Smith. So approximately 2,000 posts and more than 1,600 academics and practitioner contributors later, it now uh, has uh, uh, approximately 330,000 unique page views in the last 12 months alone. It reached uh, 1 million unique views since its inception uh, last summer. So um, the OBLB is led by a team of student editors and academics, so we're training people as well. Our academic editors are drawn not only from Oxford uh, law faculty, but also from the other university represented as co-organizers of today's conference. And we're really grateful to the external academic editors who sit in our editorial board. The blog has been very impactful. They've been cited in official documents, uh, for example, the House of Commons, the European Parliament, the European Commission, the European Central Bank, uh, the Courts of New Zealand, my personal favorite, I'm from there, and the Grand Court of the Cayman Islands. The OBLB has organized five annual conferences on highly topical subjects, Brexit in 2017, autonomous organizations in 2018, European company law in 2019, FinTech in 2020, and this year, um, business law and the transition to a net uh, zero carbon economy. Now, uh, I, I also want to tell you something about the partner organization with today's uh, conference, and that is the Oxford Sustainable Law Program at Oxford. It was launched only in this year in partnership with the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. Um, it's a rapidly growing hub for research, education, and engagement at the intersection of law and sustainability. The idea is that the potential for proactive and creative use of legal tools to address global sustainability challenges, including climate change, biodiversity uh, loss, water scarcity, and transitions in the energy and food sectors, um, the, the potential to use uh, legal tools is enormous and it's underutilized. So the program between law and the Smith School is a place for impact orientated thinkers who see law as a tool to catalyze the sustainability trans transition. Its aim is to connect legal practitioners ranging from environmental and tort law to corporate law and corporate finance and financial regulations. Um, to connect such legal practitioners with academics from various disciplines, to produce cutting edge research that has immediate practical application. So the aim is uh, a very pragmatic one to help academics, policymakers, practitioners around the world to advance sustainability outcomes. Now, within such a short time, the program has already had impact. It has assisted policymakers around the world, including in the UK, for example, in the Climate Change Community uh, Committee sorry, of the House of Lords. Uh, its work has also assisted the European Parliament, the Dutch government, the International Monetary Fund and the U UN uh, Environment Programme. It's worked with NGOs, financial institutions, law firms and corporations. Uh, the team has published in a leading scientific journal, including Nature, and the team is hiring. So please, if you're interested, see the Law Faculty website. Now, this conference focuses on the role of business law in the transition to a net zero carbon economy. That transition will require a wholesale rewiring of economic activity. 
the phasing out of carbon intensive activities in favor of low carbon activities. And in doing so, companies will need to transform themselves. And that transformation will need to be facilitated by business law. And this will in turn impact on the operation of business law. Over the next few days, you'll come across some of the questions that the net carbon zero transition raises for business law and vice versa. And these include uh, what the impact of climate risks on corporate disclosures should be, whether firms can make credible commitments to decarbonize, what role there is for shareholders in pushing through this transition, if any, and whether directors' duties and roles should change in the face of this transition. We hope that this conference will encourage business lawyers to engage with these issues in the hopes of formulating solutions that will help us all meet this significant challenge ahead of the 26th UN Climate Change Conference uh, of the parties in Glasgow in November 2021. The program looks outstanding and we are really grateful to all those who've agreed to speak and to our enormous audience from around the globe for joining us. So I welcome you to the conference and I wish you stimulation, provocation and solutions. Thank you so much, Mindy. So let's dive uh, into the first chapter of the uh, 2021 OBLB conference and with a conversation focusing on climate change disclosures and net zero commitments. So we have you know, an exciting panel uh, of speakers, but we know also that beyond our panelists, we are spoiled today with a wonderful and numerous set of attendees who are literally from all over the five continents. So it would really be a shame not to hear your questions and your comments, observations, etc. So for that, please do use the chat and we're happy to receive your, your questions at any stage. We'll try to answer as many as possible. And also, you know, again, you know, feel free to share those comments. So without further delay, uh, it's our pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Eric Talley, who is a professor at Columbia Law School and an ECGI research member. So Eric will show us how the power of machine learning can be harnessed to assess disclosures on climate risk. He will also share lessons to draw from this very effort he has engaged in with his co-authors. Immediately after Eric's presentation, a response will be offered by Madison Condon, who is a professor at Boston University School of Law. So, Eric. Thanks so much for the organizers for uh, putting this terrific uh, three-day uh, conference together. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the topics are wide ranging and I'm looking forward to, uh, to being here all three days. Um, I also want to uh, thank Madison in particular because um, Madison had to make do with an extended set of slides rather than a paper. Julian and I weren't quite able to get the paper out in time, though it should be forthcoming within a couple of weeks and I'll make sure that the, uh, the organizers post it on the website. So th this, is a, uh, this is a paper that, uh, that is nominally a, a paper that tries to use machine learning to assess climate risk disclosures. It's gonna be US focused because our data are US focused, but I think some of the lessons that, that we can take from it are a little bit more general than that. My co-author Julian Yarko is a uh, an assistant professor at Stanford Law School, and he and I started this project when he was a postdoc at Columbia a couple of years ago. So uh, let me uh, maybe come up with a start with a provocative uh, uh, beginning, which is that uh, climate risk disclosure in the U.S. Has, has been talked about for years, but I think there's a sense in which it's not really clear that we've, we've accomplished very much, at least in the securities law space. Uh, since the early 1970s, there have been uh, some halting and, 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 and not particularly uh, uh, cohesive, you know, pieces of encouragement to get uh, to get uh, issuers to uh, make uh, greater use of the disclosure mechanism to talk about climate risk. Uh, I think in many ways this culminated in 2010. There was a much ballyhooed uh, guidance that was issued by the Securities and Exchange Commission regarding climate risk disclosure and essentially a reminder that says, hey, listen, certain types of climate risk may be material to you and, and therefore you need to be disclosing them uh, in your uh, in your public filings and uh, and those 
types of disclosures that the SEC was trying to was trying to encourage were wide ranging as well, not just sort of physical impacts of climate change, but also impacts associated with regulation and legislation, also certain types of indirect consequences uh, of uh, regulation and trends such as uh, supply chain uh, shocks and disruptions and so forth. So, uh, so you know, I think this was a good faith attempt to uh, to sort of uh, push things in the direction of encouraging greater climate risk disclosure. It had a couple of flaws, and probably one of the biggest ones that we're going to be talking about. And I know from the just the other panelists, I, I I know that they have thought and written about this as well. Is that you know the longstanding institutional constraint in the U.S. and pretty much for almost any. Um, traditional financial regulator is that the SEC's regulatory mandate is all about investor protection. So, it, it, so the, these types of disclosures that one would make would not necessarily be related to is this company contributing to heating up the planet or to uh, in increased uh, carbon emissions. Uh, it would only uh, in, involve those sorts of disclosures under the standard materiality lens if that then affected some form of investor uh, returns or investor interest. So, so the, the, the causal mechanism of using securities regulation, at least as it currently exists to do this, is an elliptical one, right? That, at, that accurate risk disclosure should give rise to better price discovery, better price discovery about climate risks uh, would lead on some level that isn't completely fully specified to, uh, to uh, social cost internalization. And I think this last aspect, this idea that the SEC is all about investor protection, that it's traditionally been rooted to kind of a materiality uh, measurement, uh, and particularly in the context of the US where much of our uh, regulation is, uh, is litigation based, has, I think, stymied um, some of these efforts, not all of them, because uh, one of the problems as well, if we if we hold that aside, I'm going to come back to that at the end, is the fact that the SEC wasn't particularly clear about how companies were supposed to go about doing uh, this, about, about making these sorts of climate disclosures. And the GAO in, the, in early 2018 published a report that basically said, look, um, you know, it, it's, it's actually quite hard to weed your way through these climate disclosures as they are currently um, put into place by issuers in the U.S., uh, they are they are all over the place. There's no there's no specific place where uh, climate risk disclosures are are uh, mandated to be located. Uh, there's no way to sort of get a sense of how many of these issuers are using cookie cutter sort of uh, language versus more informative types of language. And you know the SEC largely relies on um, you know the the companies making these disclosures in good faith without any independent ways to assess the adequacy of those disclosures unless it's litigation later on. And that's kind of a standard constraint of the SEC, but you combine them together and it created uh, uh, significant problems. So the goals of this project, there are essentially three goals of this project. The, the main one really is for us to try to develop better tools, at least given the current structure of somewhat dislocated and disorganized climate risk disclosures and public findings, to, to kind of just get a better sense of when and under what circumstances companies are making these sorts of disclosures under the 2010 guidance and how helpful they are. Uh, the second, which is a little more tentative, is to, to sort of say, okay, look, if we can come up with a better tool, we think we've got one uh, for assessing uh, the, the existence, the extent of climate risk disclosures, and on some level, even their intensive margin, how, how detailed and informative they are, um, can, can we then compare that to a sense of what companies should be doing from a climate risk disclosure perspective? Um, and then finally, uh, you know, kind of re returning back to this question of how well equipped is a financial regulator like the SEC? Uh, to uh, to pursue social goals uh, that may be beyond just investor protection, and so uh, we'll I'll try to race through these things. Let me let me start with the the kind of the big um, machine learning part of this. Uh, that you know the GAO report I think is what got Julian and, and 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 me interested in this project and trying to figure out are there better ways to measure climate risk disclosure, harnessing some of the tools from machine learning, and so uh, both of us have been uh, have been engaged in projects that use you know what as is starting to emerge as I think a, a relatively standard tool set uh, for, for doing this. So uh, we accessed the SEC's Edgar database to basically pull off uh, pretty much all filings of uh, of uh, 
of, of companies, but co concentrating on 10Ks, which are the annual reports, uh, 20 Fs, which are annual reports for foreign issuers, as well as quarterly reports and unscheduled uh, 8K type reports. And, um, and, uh, and so this is sort of a, gra a grab bag, a, a, a bunch of different haystacks in which we were essentially trying to, to challenge ourselves to find climate risk disclosures within that haystack. Uh, there is a, a, you know, at least one existing data source out that's publicly available, the Ceres or Coburn and Cook uh, database. It's somewhat more limited in its research uh, scope. Uh, we're going to actually try to harness some supervised learning techniques here. And so uh, we're, we're, we think we've actually um, done, uh, made a, a material improvement on that. Um, and, uh, and the tool or the approach that we end up using, I, for, for at least things that I work on in supervised learning and, and, and machine learning, uh, has become somewhat of a, of a standard approach. And so it's essentially got three parts to it. And I'm not going to go into a ton of detail unless prodded by the audience. But, um, but you know, the, 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 it, it essentially first involves a, a pass in which we try to come up with a very, very general keyword search to try to find passages in public disclosure documents on the Edgar website that might be candidates for a climate risk disclosure. So we're going to be basically doing a very, very broad and forgiving and liberal keyword search looking for terms like climate, global warming, temperature, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, that's going to not narrow things down. There's going to be an awful lot of false positives within that list. And then we're, uh, but it, it, it will narrow it down considerably. And then we're essentially going to use uh, proto lawyers, you know, law students and, and, and research assistants at Columbia Law School and Stanford Law School to, uh, to uh, classify a randomly chosen subsample uh, for the presence or absence of disclosures. And in ongoing work, we're actually trying to um, get a little bit more on the detail and helpfulness of those disclosures. And then we're just gonna use that as a training database to calibrate and compare uh, different types of predictive models uh, to try to get a sense of what's the, you know, what's, what's the best uh, way that we can predict the existence of a climate risk disclosure. So this is essentially going to be our needle detector in the, um, in the population of haystacks. Um, so uh, like a cooking show, I'm just gonna take the baked cake out of the oven and give you a sense of how well this approach works. And we're using what's known as an, an ensemble approach. So we are essentially uh, taking a look at a bunch of different types of classifiers and trying to pick the best one. Uh, to assess which one is the best one, we are you know, basically using sort of a standard um, simulated out of sample um, uh, assessment, right? To, to train the database on, a, on nine tenths of the data of, 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 the, of the disclosures, and then try to predict the other 10% of them, wash, rinse, and repeat, and just try to figure out how well our, uh, our predictor works. And for those of you who have done work in this area, I'm super excited about, about these results because these um, essentially having, again, along pretty much all margins, standard margins of assessing accuracy, um, uh, we are you know, in, healthily into the, to the low to mid 90 percentile uh, range, which is uh, really, really good, uh, at least compared to uh, you know, as, as good as I've gotten in other, in other areas. So we're, we're pretty confident that um, you know, with some margin of error, we've actually gotten some, um, uh, some, a pretty good predictive model, at least for the extent of the existence of a, of a climate risk disclosure. Um, and, and by the way, some of this is even, you know, when you think about the error rate of, of hand coders, that's probably somewhere between three and 4%. So, uh, so this is you know, almost as good as hand coding. Um, the types of terms that you see are the types of terms that you would expect to see in the ones that finally make, uh, make the cut. This is our attempt to have a climate-related word cloud. I'm not sure how successful it is, but you can kind of see some of the terms that are, that, that are, that are frequently prevalent in these areas. And, and we also find a fair amount of heterogeneity of the types of disclosures that you see. Uh, I've given you two examples on kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum. The first is a very, very general, almost cookie cutter, maybe not even so helpful form of, of, of disclosure that says, oh, climate you know, regs and, 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 and legislation could change in the future, and that might affect our returns. Uh, the second one is much more detailed, uh, dealing with uh, ongoing Supreme Court jurisprudence and, uh, and regulatory um, uh, patterns. Uh, another thing that we can do once we've identified these cl climate risk disclosures is to sort of say how similar are they to each other, which is a sort of an indirect measure of cookie cutterness of these sorts of disclosure. And this is essentially a, a heat map, an in-liar, outlier heat map 
uh, in which we have essentially reduced the content of these disclosures to two dimensions um, uh, using sort of standard machine learning dimensionality reduction. And you can see that there are a lot of clusters of very, very similar doc, um, uh, documents or very similar passages that make these disclosures. These are closely rated, related to industries. You will often see industry clustering along with this textual clustering uh, in this context. Um, in some cases, these are long disclosures. So it's just a very, very detailed but highly repetitive disclosure. In in other cases, it's more like the cookie cutter dis disclosure that I gave you the before. Um, on disclosures by industry, uh, the standard um, the, the standard suspects do emerge from this uh, from this uh, analysis, as you would expect. That that uh, that extraction industries, transportation industries, construction industries tend to be the most heavy users of, of, of climate risk disclosures during this period of time, which, by the way, ends in 2017. Um, and uh, and uh, but there, but you see it across all industries as well, and there definitely is a little bit of copycatting uh, that goes on in this industry. Um, we do a horse race between how well um, we're able to, to, uh, to classify and uh, at least this one existing publicly available database. And one thing we do pretty well, um, we, we have some issuers that they don't and they have some issuers that we don't, but of the ones that we have in common, um, we, uh, we, we you know, think that they have actually um, have a, a fairly high false positive rate um, and there aren't as many disclosures making disclosures as uh, as uh, as, uh, as 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 they're as they're rooting out, but we think we compare quite favorably on on that basis. Um, which public companies should be making climate risk disclosures is a much harder question to answer. Um, and in some ways, this parlays onto the second problem that the SEC has is that they don't, you know, there's, there's, there's you know, asymmetric information as to exactly what type of climate risk um, uh, sensitivities each issuer has. Um, and so uh, there are a couple different ways to go about it. Uh, one is to try to, you know, develop kind of from the top down, you know, SASB type factors for, uh, for disclosure. Uh, another way is a little bit more of a bottom-up uh, approach, and, and that's what we're going to use here. And, and here we're essentially kind of riffing on some of the, some of the um, definitions within U.S. securities law on materiality to try to get a sense of whether there is a climate-related um, vulnerability of returns within companies' uh, companies' uh, stock returns. So the idea would be to say, hey, listen, if we could come up with some way to measure climate-related shocks to the systematic fundamentals that that uh, that uh, that apply to the market, um, and then uh, those shocks were uh, thought as as um, altering distribution of of the returns for at least certain types of issuers, that should be reflected in um, market prices and returns of these issuers. So uh, what we do, and this is way more tentative, but we essentially throw a, um, a kind of an asset pricing uh, uh, approach at, at, at this problem to sort of say, hey, listen, you know, we're familiar now with thinking about like the capital asset pricing model or the Fama French three-factor model that basically tries to assess the, the spread of the returns on some asset against these various macroeconomic factors. Uh, what if we, for arguments that say, thought about coming up with another factor, a climate related factor that we generated from data about various types of climate risks. Um, and the idea would then be to sort of throw that, that fourth factor or that, that additional factor into one of these asset pricing uh, estimations, uh, use you know, 20 years worth of stock data to try to get a sense of whether this, this climate factor predicts abnormal returns, some type of, uh, some type of uh, alpha, either positive or negative, in uh, in the returns of a company, so there was a you know basically ran a whole bunch of uh, cap M or or Fama French regressions with an additional uh, climate factor. Now that climate factor itself. Um, uh, there's not one that's off the shelf. Every one of these other asset pricing models has one that is off the shelf. And so coming up with this, uh, this asset pricing um, factor uh, is, uh, is tricky. Uh, so what we're doing here, and, and again, this is you know, a little bit spitballing this, but uh, we're basically trying to take a bunch of data that we have about global temperature variations, climate regulation and litigation, 
and major weather events um, and uh, essentially smush them all together using, again, some machine learning dimensionality reduction into a one dimensional climate factor. There's a whole bunch of ways we, you can do this. We've experimented with three or four. I won't show you my nice video here, but uh, e each one of these things turns out that we have some, uh, particularly at Columbia, we have pretty good access to some of these data. Uh, it's a large amount of data and we are you know, quite literally smushing it into a single climate factor to kind of get a sense of you know, what type of a climate beta do some of these uh, companies have. Um, and uh, cobbling them together um, is, uh, ends up, I, I will confess, loses a lot of the richness of these, these data sets. Though there are different ways to, to test the robustness of, of, of this approach, and that's kind of what we are experimenting now. Um, so basically what we are, we are essentially using that one dimensional um, reduced dimensionality measure of climate variability as a fourth factor in a, in a you know, otherwise a Fama French model. Um, and, uh, you know, we end up being able to estimate beta values. We have uh, some variability of these beta values uh, that, that you could essentially read as a climate beta for a company. Uh, and I guess there are two ways to think of, of significance, right? One is statistical significance away from zero, either positive or negative, uh, which I'll show you a few results on. Another, I guess, would be numerical significance, significance just large uh, large uh, values. I'll, I'll concentrate on the more conventional statistical significance. Um, here are uh, here are some you know some of the most significant sort of estimated climate climate beta um, uh, companies that you see out there. Uh, they are a little bit all over the place, but there are some suspects that you would expect to be uh, in this set as well. Peabody Energy, I think, is a uh, a particularly um, uh, notable poster child in the U.S. since it was one of the first that the state attorney general went after in New York for its own inadequacies of climate risk disclosures, uh, and it is one of these uh, one of these companies that's uh, fairly extreme on the on the on the list of of, of estimated uh, estimated uh, sensitivities to climate factors. Um, <clears throat> if we were to uh, basically compare this question of do you have a significant climate beta to did you make a disclosure? Do you have a practice of making disclosures? <clears throat> we see something that I think is actually a little bit depressing is that, yes, there is a generally larger tendency of companies that have a larger estimated climate beta to be making these sorts of disclosures. It does suggest that we're capturing something. Um, uh, it's a fairly, it, it's, it's less imbalanced than you might otherwise expect. And so uh, either this means that our, our measure is quite noisy, which I confess it probably is, or people are still trying to figure out, <clears throat> excuse me, what they're doing in this zone. Um, and so that's kind of where we are in this process. And one of the things we're trying to do is to <clears throat> beat these results up to see how robust they are against different forms of measurement of, uh, of uh, climate vulnerability. One last slide here, and then I'm going to open it up to Madison's question. So, I, at the end of the day, suppose we end up being completely successful in this project that we and we think we've done a good job of measuring <clears throat> the existence of climate risk disclosures, but also trying to get at least some independent measurement of who's making these climate risk disclosures. Is that going to help very much? Is that and this this relaunches this question that I had at the beginning of the presentation? <clears throat> Is this going to give rise to a situation where um, we actually are incentivizing? <laughs> companies to uh, to make better disclosures? And I think the answer is maybe, but maybe not, right? On the one hand, uh, this adds greater transparency, shines a, a brighter light on uh, the types of issuers who are and who are not taking climate risk seriously, at least for the purposes of their investors. Cookie cutter disclosures are easily detected. Uh, disclosure menus and frameworks and compliance with them, once, uh, once they're a little bit further matured, TFCB or SASB, would also facilitate that kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of outing of companies that were either really good compliers or, or, or not. Um, materiality measures might give us a little bit of purchase on this as well. But I think we're still stuck with the institutional constraint that I laid out at the beginning of the presentation that the SEC's mandate still very much centers on investor protection. And it's unclear to us, at least, whether better disclosure practices 
are always going to necessarily lead in the same direction as you know minimizing carbon footprint uh, only to the extent that that ends up having financial implications for shareholders that a reasonable investor would care about does under existing uh, SEC's mandate uh, does that end up kind of uh, aligning the stars and so how would you think about doing it well one possibility is to broaden the SEC's mandate, make it more than about investor protection. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about doing that. I think the SEC's mandate on investor protection is already quite broad, um, and it would be um, it would be sort of difficult to anticipate what kind of administrative drift you would see there. I think. Personally, I think a, a, a potentially better, at least short to medium term approach is simply to sharpen the incentives of capital investors in a way that makes climate risk disclosures more likely to be material. And there's both ex external and internal ways to do it. Externally, you could just have you know, stronger environment, or environmental forms of regulation and penalties imposed by other administrative agencies, such as the New York's Attorney General's Office, the EPA, and so forth. That will matter to shareholders. That could be material to shareholders. And as a result, disclosures would be directly related to materiality. I think maybe an even more promising one, uh, and, and we definitely uh, have seen this, this market pick up, is to use internal contracting measures, encourage various types of green bond financing and securitization that have benchmarks related to overall reductions in, um, in uh, carbon footprint. And why would that matter? Well, effectively, that would essentially get, you know, whether meet, you meet or you don't meet those benchmarks would give rise to uh, considerable transfer payments between bondholders and shareholders. Since both are considered to be securities, ex ante disclosures about those types of risks are also more likely to look material from an ex ante perspective. And so um, from, from my perspective, maybe the quickest way to align these stars, if one wanted to do it, is simply to try to encourage more um, uh, financial contracting that is predicated on meeting some of these broader, um, broader climate benchmarks uh, and, and, and possibly some tax and subsidy uh, policies, which were in the middle of debating in the United States might be a way to do it. So that's it. I'm gonna I'm gonna close up because I think I've already exceeded my 20 minutes by a couple and uh, and hand it over to Madison. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, okay, so why don't I just go through and give just a few things that I thought of in response to your talk, and then we can try to pull some questions from the audience. So first is you you led with this question of this problem that the SEC's mandate is institution is investor protection uh, rather than maybe something more broad than that. And I don't know, I see the discourse shifting a little bit. There is indication to me that Gensler sees the SEC as having a financial stability mandate beyond just investor protection. And obviously, you know, there's been a lot of writing and thinking about how changes in the capital markets actually might shift what we think of as like a reasonable investor, as like a typical investor, and whether or not we think of the major asset managers being exposed to climate change as a systemic or a systematic risk. And, you know, the asset managers are being pretty explicit, actually, that they use climate disclosures and climate related information not to make trades or not for like price seeking information, but explicitly for governance measures and for monitoring directors. And I think that there's actually willingness with the SEC to um, take that seriously and adopt that into their mandate and think of, that, of climate change as a systemic or a systematic risk. Um, I think that's also obviously reflected in Biden's just recent executive order in which he sort of points, that to, points to FSOC as one of major coordinating agencies to think about climate change as a systemic risk. And obviously disclosure was a very large part of that executive order. <clears throat> so we'll see what happens on that front. Um, I guess I wanted to ask you a little bit about, well, one in your methodology of collecting the data. So, um, you know, one, you're just focusing on official disclosures and it's a lot, a lot of this information is being disclosed, uh, especially in the transition risk front in non-official disclosures outside of the 10Ks and the SKs um, in you know, sustainability reports and energy outlooks. I mean, and, and these things are clearly, you know, they're being used by investors and they're, they, they clearly matter in the disclosure landscape that in the New York Attorney General's lawsuit against Exxon, the energy outlook made outside of the official disclosures was actually a really large part of that lawsuit. So I just wonder, 
whether you're, whether you feel like you're capturing like the universe of information as like, as it matters and is being used by the market. Um, okay, a another question I have is, you know, there's been a lot of work on, you know, this, this construction of a climate beta has been the project of every ESG investor like in the past six years. And, you know, if you were actually able to construct a climate beta, you could potentially make a lot of money. So I'm wondering if you have thought, and I've, you know, in watching what all the ESG investors who are trying to calculate sort of like a climate risk exposure beta, either physical risk or transition risk, you've blunt them together. Um, lessons that I've learned from watching that work. And, you know, one problem is that when, even when issuers do disclose their climate risk information, it happens at the issuer level, right? It doesn't happen at the actual like sub asset level. And so if you're talking about a mining company that's based in Brazil, but has mines all over South America and Africa, I'm, you're not capturing that when you're actually running the regression in your climate risk beta, you're not, you're not really saying anything about whether that mining company's assets are physically exposed to climate risk. Um, um, I guess, oh, and this was a, this was a question that was in the chat, but I also had this thought, you know, there's lots of ways of talking about climate risk and climate change without ever mentioning the word climate. Um, and I'm just wondering about your methodology in the sense that like, when you're talking about climate change, you're really talking about like the entire economy, like literally everything will change slowly in some amount. Um, so I'm wondering if what you think about it, what you're missing in terms of like disease or uh, general transition risks in general. So, you know, like the, the PCAOB, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, um, initially claimed that like in critical audit matters, in assessments of um, how auditors were flagging some of like the major, issue, major issues that were extremely hard to audit in issuer disclosures. Um, one of their concerns was that none of them were talking about climate change. But that's mostly on like a rough keyword search, whereas if you actually dig into the disclosures that were being made or the critical audit matters that were being flagged by the auditors, they were actually a base about climate change. They just did a really lot of effort to avoid mentioning climate change. So like, you know, literally every oil and gas company is in some way disclosing something about climate change, whether they call it that or not is a different question. Um, <clears throat> Madison, why don't we give Eric an opportunity to answer now, All my questions, this, this sure. Question. And then you'll have a chance to come back to come back in and perhaps also, you know, um, sort of speak up a few of the questions, the numerous questions that are in, that are in the in the chat that you could also, you know, sort of uh, translate uh, translate for us. So, but Eric, uh, I think there's already quite some work for you now to do. So you want to? Yep, no doubt there is some work for me to do. So thanks so much, uh, Madison. I've got. Uh, a few uh, a few comments or a few riffs on um, on uh, your questions, which are excellent and I think appropriate, and then we can open it up to the chat room as well. Uh, so uh, on the SEC's mandate, uh, yes, I agree. There's a greater discussion about whether the mandate should pertain to something larger to things like financial stability. Query whether that's going to require congressional action in order to get there. I think there's a, a, a reasonable argument that it will, or at least a, a, the ability to make that argument that it's going to require additional congressional um, action to get there. Um, and uh, the creation of a jurisprudence to figure out exactly how, uh, how one measures it. So maybe that's the long-term goal that that, that people are pushing for, I'm somewhat skeptical that that's going to um, that, that that's going to cash out in in maybe I'm just too cynical and I should be more optimistic about how Washington operates. But um, but I, I I'm 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 a little bit worried about that. Um, I, I agree with you that changes in capital markets um, have been given have been giving rise to um, greater emphasis on overall climate risk. I like that. I think that in order to be um, even dur even more durable and fit within the SEC's pre-existing mandate, um, the more financial contracting that you have that is predicated on, on those sorts of metrics, uh, the more it's going to just naturally fit within sort of standard definitions of uh, materiality. Okay, last thing, and then we can take it to um, uh, we, we can take it to some uh, to, to some questions uh, from from the audience on data methodology. You are correct. We are um, we are looking at official disclosures, and we're imposing that uh, in our at least our first pass 
to identify candidate disclosures uh, that we are uh, requiring a climate related type word. Now we work pretty hard to build up a vocabulary of climate related words. I think your question there, you know, but both of these types of questions stores is look, are you gonna, are these both potential concerns for a false negative with your, with your methodology where you fail to find a climate risk disclosure, but it's there, it's either not in a 10K, it's in a sustainability report, or they're just not using some of the same magic words, no matter how copious the the the, uh, the keyword search that you used uh, might be. So on the on the official disclosures, yeah, we, we've actually transitioned this project to start looking at sustainability reports, which we have access to, and uh, you can throw exactly the same uh, things at it. And the one thing I can tell you is that uh, that there are additional disclosures that we're not finding in 10Ks that would be uh, in there. I think one of the reasons we did it this way at the beginning uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to try to, um, uh, to try to just get a sense of whether we, we were adding something of value is um, the, the Coburn Cook database pretty much limits itself to 10Ks and 20Fs. Uh, um, and, and, so, uh, and so we wanted to make sure that on, on those basis, bases alone, we were doing a good job, but there's absolutely nothing that would constrain us from then take porting that out and say, let's take the whole thing to uh, a different set of, of reports. I'm a, I'm a little bit less um, optimistic about what we can do about saying, oh, look, let's not, um, let's not use climate related vocabulary as a limiting um, element for, uh, for our keyword search. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, you, you know this, right, that, that, that issuers, there are always these forward looking statements and issuers and, you know, probably the most general is like really bad stuff that we can't predict might happen in the future. Is that a climate risk disclosure? I, you know, I kind of feel like uh, if that is a climate risk disclosure, then kind of any forward looking risk assessment that's of a general nature would be. And so I think we were trying to find something with a little bit more traction. There's nothing that would prevent us from saying, okay, look, um, Condon helped us out in giving us a, a few of the like dog whistle um, words that are also about, about um, climate risk that companies just don't want to mention. We could certainly add that to a keyword search, but I have some, I have some unease about our ability to like make that keyword search, you know, so copious that we get, we don't have any more false negatives. The problem is that we're just absolutely chock full of false positives, which you know may be one of the one of the things that distinguishes us. And then the final thing, I, I, I love this um, point, though it's really challenging to sort of say, look, can you quantify risk at the sub asset level? Julie and I have been working a little bit with the Rocky Mountain Institute to try to do this with kind of satellite imagery of like um, oil well blowouts and natural gas well blowouts uh, to try to get a sense of whether um, those sorts of events. Uh, end up, uh, you know, predicting meaningful variation in um, in uh, in returns. Uh, it's it's a pretty cool application in a very specific industry. I don't know how how well it's going to scope out to kind of everything, right? This is uh, this is one uh, sense of information or one source of information that we have that can be uh, super helpful. Okay, with that, let me. Um, I don't, uh, Genevieve. I don't know how much time we have yeah. for questions. So yeah. we have. Okay, we have you know so many questions in the chat. So Alessio Patches will uh, you know will be able to voice a question. I don't think we can see him, but we'll hear his voice. And then Jill uh, will Jill Fish will also ask a question. And I suggest we take both questions together. Then you have some more time to to uh, to answer. So Alessio. Thank you uh, for well, promoting me to to uh, to speak in this uh, very very nice group and, and thanks Eric for the very interesting paper. So I, I put my question in the chat, but I mean, I try to summarize a little bit the context. So in, in Europe, uh, there is a, a, a tendency to include uh, investor non-financial preferences in, in, in the definition of investor protection. Okay, I, I, I could add more detail, but uh, that in a sense relieves one of your concern. I mean, it's not just about climate risk disclosure, but you know how, how, how climate friendly you are, and that's a bit of setup that it is it's coming out. But what I wonder here, because I'm I'm trying to do something, uh, that, so I'm excited actually to read your paper when it will be available, something similar to what you're doing. 
but I think the challenge here is to identify the, the right keywords and the right document. I mean, you said that before. So my question would be, how would you investigate? I assume that you jump on this side of the Atlantic and take my word for it, we're evolving in that direction. Uh, how would you adapt your, your research design to investigate uh, whether, let's say, um, both companies and, and provider of financial product are serious about being sustainable in any dimension, you, like for instance, environmental one? Okay, Great. Eric, why don't you answer now? Because we are bridging the gap, you know, sort of moving from one continent to another. Yeah, yeah, and this is a, a perfectly appropriate question to ask, Alessio. Um, so, uh, so non-financial preferences are obviously something that, particularly with the sort of European model, um, it lends itself much better to, right? Where you, where there are, uh, you know, it, it's almost like you could almost think of it as a menu for climate risk type. Uh, type disclosures. Um, and uh, and uh, that has, you know, traditionally been something that the SEC has shied away from, particularly in this area, and try and they try to have, you know, materiality do a lot of this risk, uh, do a lot of this work. That having been said, I think it would still be possible to do this. I guess there are two, uh, to, to, to deploy a, a set of techniques similar to what Julie and I are trying to do here. I think, I think the, the two constraints to doing that are first, um, the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 a mature and publicly available database for doing it. And I think there are, that's now starting to happen, uh, but it's, it's often been a constraint for doing um, at least continental-based uh, European uh, research. Um, and, and then I think uh, um, once one did that, um, I, there, there still could potentially be, and it would, it would, it would matter exactly what type of disclosures being made. If it's really just kind of, you know, check the box in a menu of disclosures, uh, then there's really no way to to avoid a kind of a cookie cutter disclosure. But if there is room for context and is there's if there's room for detail, some of these same tools could be used to get a sense of look of these companies that are making climate disclosures. How many of them are are actually adding sufficient uh, sufficient unique content and detail to be helpful from um, from a regulator's perspective or from an investor's perspective, or for that matter, from just a general public advocate's perspective. So I, I think some of these approaches are going to be useful there as well. But just going back to a point that Madison made, which I think is a correct point, is that, um, is that you know, this first pass on keywords really, really matters. Um, and while we tried to articulate a set of keywords that we think is relatively capacious for purposes of US investors, there's, there's no guarantee, particularly given the more narrow historical uh, regulatory mandates of financial regulators or securities regulators in the US that, um, that we've, you know, we would use the same list if we were trying to do that with European disclosures. Thank you. So Jill Fish, would you like? Yes. To, uh... Yeah, thank you. So Eric, it's a great paper. I wanted to follow up on Madison's point that a lot of this disclosure takes place in sustainability reports or even other reports, right? A lot of times you have shareholder proposals asking a company to disclose and that disclosure, if it responds to the shareholder proposals in a separate document. Um, so I'm delighted that you're looking at those documents as well. And I just wanted to suggest it would be really useful particularly for the SEC's current rulemaking, to do more sort of comparative analysis. Are these uh, disclosures complements or substitutes? Um, is the quality of the disclosures different in sustainability reports? Obviously, if it's in an SEC filing, it's more likely to be subject to auditing or some sort of external assurance. Some companies think they face more liability exposure if it's in the 10K rather than in the sustainability report. And finally, sustainability reports also respond to your concern about the SEC documents being primarily investor oriented, sustainability reports, I think, are typically prepared for audience. So I think having both uh, sets of data really allows you to, to do a lot that this, you know, beyond this paper. Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, am I still on mute or am I off? Okay, yeah, these are great suggestions. Uh, we've gotten partway down the road in trying to, trying to do a horse race against uh, sustainability reports. Um, and uh, and sort of ordinary file documents at the SEC. Uh, there is not complete overlap. I can tell you that, uh, Jill. So I think on some level, uh, you know, that 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 suggests. I don't know whether to call those structural complements or substitutes with one another, right? But but the lack of complete overlap suggests that there are at least some companies that think they should be doing a lot of that work in a sustainability report, 
as opposed to a um, as opposed to a, uh, a a file document that 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 is that is up on Edgar. I guess the other question, you know, one of the things you raise, and you're exactly right that that uh, that 14 a I propose these these shareholder proposals are, you know, they, they've just ballooned in the last couple of years on on climate risk disclosures. Often management will then have to make a statement, right, about whether you know. The, the, um, you should vote for it or not. And we have not tried to look at those, um, but there are enough of them now that I think it might be worthwhile uh, trying to trying to pack those in. You know, in terms of the audience, the broader audience for sustainability reports, I agree. I think the, op the both the audience and the optics are larger for sustainability reports. If you're worried about litigation exposure, you're probably still going to be kind of kind of corralled back to something that's a you know that's more similar to the traditional SEC mandate, right? You're worried about either investor lawsuits or possibly an SEC action that then itself it's going to bootstrap some of these materiality questions inside it. Um, so uh, so you know I guess that's maybe just another way of saying I'm, it may be the case that there's less exposure if you put in a sustainability report because this is meant for a broader audience, but I'm not sure it automatically follows.